how Brian comes up with these games. That would be totally intimidating to me. Uh, so teaching a Bible study is a lot easier than that. So there's no good transition into that. So just open your Bible uh, to Exodus chapter 19. That's where we are. And uh, so uh, there's a, a guy named Jared Stephen wrote a book on mountaintop experiences because there's a lot of them in the Bible. And the biggest connection with Exodus 19 and the New Testament is that uh, Moses is there uh, receiving the law. And of course, in the book of Matthew, you have the transfiguration where Jesus is up on a mountain. Moses is there. And uh, so there's this connection between Jesus being the new and better Moses because, just spoiler alert, Moses goes up into the mountain, speaks on behalf of God, acts as a priest, and comes down and tells people how they can relate to God. They can't go to the mountain, but he can. And so um, here is the Mosaic Covenant in Exodus chapter 19. So before we get into that, though, let's talk a minute about mountaintop experiences. And so we'll go to our groups at the end, but let's have a little mini group time right now. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? Like, could be professionally, could be spiritually, where there was a moment that was a clarifying moment for you. Maybe it was a trajectory change. God spoke to you in a unique way, and you still remember it. You know, if you get you alone, say, I can absolutely recall that. So if you would talk about that at your table. We'll do that maybe 10 minutes to do that. Then we'll come back, and we're going to talk about what makes a mountaintop experience. So talk about what happened to you, your mountaintop experience, and then we'll come back as a little bit later and talk about mountaintop experiences. So let's take a few minutes to do that in our groups. All right, so let's talk about a mountaintop experience. So what, so what factors would define a mountaintop experience? What is, that, what is that like? Give me some adjectives, some descriptors. Clarity. Clarity. Yeah. Life-changing. Life okay. Growth. What's that? Growth. Broke? Growth. Oh, growth. I thought you said broke. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, growth. Revelation, okay, yeah. Inspiring. Powerful, Powerful yeah. It, it is, it's amazing how that works, right? And even, uh, I'll call out Caleb, as we were talking about that. He shared his story. He said, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. That's therapeutic. <laughs> but it is. When you go back and reflect, you think, man, that's, you know, that's really good. God really leveraged whatever I was going through to, to, man, give me a tremendous amount of clarity. And you don't know how that works, right? Because you don't. I mean, how does that work? Because you can go through years of something, then all of a sudden in a moment, you just, God does something. And, and um, um, did anybody at your table describe something that was a mountaintop, but it was also a valley? Anybody like that? Like, yeah, several, let's see heads nodding. Like, this was a low point, but all of a sudden out of that came this great clarity. And so some, in the Tuesday morning guy group, guy says, my mountaintop is really a desert. <laughs> I thought, uh, that doesn't make sense, but it makes perfect sense. Because God will leverage those moments. Um, and that's why the mountaintop is a good metaphor. Because a mountain is exclusive. It's one specific place. It's, it's somewhere you don't live. You visit. And then out of that experience, you know, you move on. And this, going back to Exodus chapter 19, is, is the defining mountaintop experience. So let's set it up a little bit. And then we're going to look at chapters 19 and then a little bit into 20. Um, so they've come out of Egypt. They've been saved by the blood of the lamb. Literally, it was on the doorpost. That's how they got out. Uh, but now they have to make this adjustment. They have to figure out how to live a life with God. So then they go over uh, the Red Sea. And then that's uh, in uh, chapter 14. And then in uh, the water from the rock is chapter 17. Chapter 18 is where uh, Jethro pushes Moses on uh, administration, how he's going to lead. And then in chapter 19, let's pick up there in verse uh, 1. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. And that date is, is important. We'll see later. On that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. They encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. Now, we saw this in Exodus chapter 3, right? Mount Horeb. And it's, that's very important. It's the same mountain. So the first place he saw the burning bush is there. But, so there's some similarities and some differences. 
The Lord called them out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession. So three things here. My treasure possessions among all people, but the others mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So all three of those are important. God's treasure possession. So this is unique, right? It used to be the whole world, and all the world belongs to God, but this is a unique people within a people. And then he says, a kingdom of priests, and this is really predicting the New Testament. So what, what is a priest? What's the function of a priest? What does a priest do? Yeah, intermediate with God. So a priest goes to God on behalf of men and may at times go to men on behalf of God. In between, So you don't have access to God without a priest. And so he says, I'm predicting a day where you'll be a kingdom of priests. And that theme is picked up in Jeremiah 31 with the new covenant. All people have access to God. Of course, we know that's through Jesus. And then a holy nation. And the word, what does the word holy mean? Uh, so they have the nations, but this one is different. It's a, it's a holy nation. Um, yeah, set apart, unique. And that's a huge theme throughout this. This is the covenant, and this is a huge theme throughout this because Moses went before God in Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush, but now the bush is not on fire. We'll see later the whole mountain is on fire. It's filled with smoke. And before, Moses, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. Well, in this case, none of the people could go before the mountain. If they touch it, they had to either be stoned or shot, it's what it says. And my ESV translation says, it puts a footnote, shot with an arrow. And I think they put it there for Texans, Oklahoman, and Arkansans who would think, <laughs> what caliber of weapon would they be shot with? And so he just clarify, shot with an arrow. I don't know why they put that in there, but they put that in there. So, um, so all this is about the covenant uh, before God. So again, this is their mountaintop experience. Now here's the big question that we all have to face, and that is, how do you turn an impulse to obedience into a lifetime of obedience, right? I mean, that's, that's the massive question. So there are formulas that you can use to get yourself fired up to go work out, right? And the same is true with spiritually. I know what song uh, to play, what sermon to listen to, if there's caffeine involved, it doesn't hurt. All these kind of elements come together, and you're just fired up. Man, we can take things on, and, and we need those moments. It's good to have an impulse to obedience. But how do you turn an impulse of obedience into a lifetime of obedience? And so in verse 7, it shifts from the idea of a covenant to the idea of consecration. Consecration. And that's a big word, but it's mentioned two times here. And the idea of consecration is just something that's, that's unique, and it's set apart. So look at verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And that's important because he had no way to communicate. There wasn't uh, any type of system loud enough where he could talk to all the people. So he gathered the elders, he talked to them, and they went back to their respective clans, and they talked to the people. Verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe forever. And after their obedience, in fact, if you want, we're going to come right back to that. But skip over to chapter 24. This just um, came to mind. So... Exodus 24, 1 says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, uh, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come with him. And so what happens in the preceding verses is that God commands Moses to build altars uh, on those 12 pillars representing the, uh, 12 pillar, the 12 tribes of Israel, verse 5 says, He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And then this is interesting, verse 6, Moses took half of the blood, this is from those offerings, put it in basins, half of the blood he threw against the altar. 
Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. So that after this, they received the Ten Commandments. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. There's some things you can act out, right, in a church play. This is not one of them. We can't, we can't do this. Half the blood goes on the altar. Half the blood goes on the people. So let's talk. So tell me about what's the symbolism that's there. Yeah, Jesus, this is where the expected answer is the exact right answer. Uh, but how graphic is that? The connection is real. The blood on the altar means it's, it's mediating. It's going before God. Smoke rises off the altar like prayers. Blood is on the altar because Jesus sacrificed the altar. But the blood is also covering them. And so here God is connecting them, but he's connecting them through the blood. But before he does that, though, he asks him this question. Um, are you going to do what God has called you to do? So again, if we're to press the metaphor onto us, they've already been saved. This consecration is not earning their salvation. It's simply a response to it. So once you've come into the covenant, the response is faithfulness, that you're going to keep the covenant with God and you're going to remain faithful to him and be consecrated to him. And so the idea is wholehearted obedience to God. So um, the, the mountaintop experience was receiving the covenant they couldn't go around it or touch it because it was holy, but Moses wanted to know, are you all in? And then later it's sealed with uh, the blood. Uh, one, one other thought, and then we'll go into our groups. Look at back in, in uh, verse 1, back in chapter 19. He's talking about the, the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. On that day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. And so he's given a very specific time stamp to this. So what that would have meant is that would have been 48 days after the Passover. So the actual first Passover, uh, they go out of the wilderness. This is 48 days later. Uh, the next day is when they're setting up camp. And on the 50th day is what would have started the Feast of Weeks or 50 days after Passover was something else in the New Testament. What is that? It was Pentecost, right? So this is when the Holy Spirit comes down and everything changes because Jesus is predicting this is actually going to be the new normal. Now I'm not going to be here physically. The Holy Spirit is going to be here. And this relationship with me is going to be mediated through the whole person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus died, of course, during the time of Passover. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit uh, comes and uh, descends, Acts chapter 2. And this is the day that Jesus, who is our mediator between us and between God, um, allows us that relationship to be realized through the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the point being is, for us, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the grace to be consecrated to keep the covenant before God. And all of our insufficiencies and incompleteness and fears. Now, you know, you do this a couple of times, have a couple of mountaintop experiences. You begin to wonder as it's happening, as the Lord's speaking to you, I wonder if I can follow this through. <laughs> I wonder if I can be faithful to God. And our confidence is not in our capacity to do so, but rather the promise of the Spirit that was fulfilled to bring all that to us. All right, well, let's pray. And then we'll go into our groups. Uh, and then Brian will come and wrap it up here in a few minutes. Father God, we are so grateful, Lord, that just like Israel, we were saved by the blood of Jesus, that we have a call on our lives to be faithful to your covenant and to consecrate ourselves, set ourselves apart for what you've called us to do. And we thank you for even here in Exodus chapter 19, uh, this template, uh, this hint of the Holy Spirit that's going to come later to give us the grace to be faithful when we can't be faithful. And Lord, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.